How many millennials does it take to change a light bulb? Well, I hate to disappoint you, but the answer is just one. However, he will also be snapping a selfie of himself doing it. He has to text his hundreds of thousands of friends on Facebook that he is doing it. And of course, he has to find an app to find out when the new bulb will be expiring. And this joke, which is admittedly a somewhat lame one that I made up, is an illustration of what the Beloit College Mindset List has rather famously been tracking since 1998, which is that today's young people, millennials as they're typically called, are in fact addicted to digital technology. They have a lot of savvy about high technology. They spend a great deal of time texting. Some of them are very good at texting. I can tell you right now that my daughter can text war and peace while I'm trying to sort of tap out, I miss you. <laughs> and so the impression may be left. In fact, I know it's left because I've talked to a lot of people. The millennials are simply, in fact, a shallow, distracted, and idle generation, mainly because they have been spoiled by digital technology. Well, I am here to say today, here in River City, Wisconsin, that indeed that's not true. And furthermore, it is precisely because millennials are so addicted and savvy with high technology that they have in fact emerged, I think, as one of the most educable generations that we have. Now, I think that one of the reasons that uh, this idea has been slow to really be understood or grasped is not just because uh, millennials, you know, uh, are sitting in coffee shops and don't look ulsters in the face. Instead, they fiddle with their smartphones. It's also because we just can't quite shake the somewhat misleading metaphor about what American higher education is about. We still have this idea that students arrive with an empty head and they leave four years later with a full head. But in fact, it's not true so much as that. Students arrive with unskilled minds and they leave with skilled minds if we do our job well and they do their job well. And so what I want to talk about today then is the extent to which the acquisition of sophisticated intellectual skills is very consistent with digital technology, the digital technology that they are very familiar with, and that such skills are very much in the sweet spot of, indeed, that higher technology. And I'll start with something that's very counterintuitive, texting and tweeting. Texting and tweeting would seem to be completely antithetical to any kind of intellectual rigor. But if Sherlock Holmes were around today, and I guess he sort of is in this high-tech version on PBS, he would in fact very, very much profoundly disagree. And let's not forget Sherlock Holmes was a very smart man. Because Holmes used to say to Watson, Watson, I like telegrams because telegrams force me to pare down information and ideas to their essential features. Well, of course, telegrams have come back in the form of tweets and texts, and they force us, used properly, to pare down information and ideas to their fundamental essentials. Let me give you an example of how this works. Some years ago, a group of philosophers sponsored a contest in which they uh, asked contestants to come up with a tweet-sized definition of philosophy, and there were some wonderful entries. The winning one, and I don't know what the winner got, probably you know the complete works of Hume or something, okay, was philosophy is a room with innumerable locks and the occasional gilded key, which is a wonderful definition, one out of which, in fact, you can not only generate a bumper sticker, but an article, an essay, a monograph, and a whole library of books. When I was teaching at Beloit, I read many, many, many student essays, alas, which I would dub 40 glittering generalizations looking for a thesis sentence. Someone like Pirandello's, you know, 12 actors looking for a character, or 12 characters looking for an actor. 
And <clears throat> this is because students had enormous difficulty mastering the thesis statement that was short and sweet and pithy and that could, in fact, govern and unify a whole essay. Well, tweets and texts used properly and applied properly can, in fact, be very, very consistent with acquiring this very, very, very high cognitive skill. That's texts. Next, I'll move quickly in the interest of time, there's flipping, as in the flipped classroom. The flipped classroom is made possible by digital technology, and it is a classroom in which students do their homework in class and their classwork at home. That is to say, they can listen to professors' lectures on video, thanks to high technology, at home, and they can then work on applications collaboratively in the classroom. Let me give you an example. When I used to teach rhetorical theory, one of the major thinkers I taught was Kenneth Burke. Kenneth Burke was, in fact, the great analysand of the idea that rhetoric was fundamentally a matter of drama, somewhat like you know, my rhetoric now, which may have a little drama in it, I hope. And he, in fact, sort of developed this thesis in myriad ways. What about, for example, someone, a professor of rhetoric, teaching Kenneth Burke's principles and theories, podcasted or videoed. And then the students get together and they try to apply what they have learned. They become flies on the wall. They go out to bars, restaurants, residence halls, shopping malls. They listen to conversations. Is there a rhetoric in everyday conversation? And to what extent is the everyday conversational rhetoric also dramatic. That is to say, to what extent do Burke's theories and ideas work in more informal and implicit types of rhetorical situations? Students and faculty members, or students and the faculty member, can collabor collaborate in this investigation. They can come back. They can compare notes. They can compare their resources. They can write papers. They can write articles. They can put together a website. But this kind of efficient use of application, which is very, very, very much consistent, by the way, with Beloit College's Center for the Applied Liberal Arts, is very, very, very much made possible by the fact that you can now get your lectures at home and you can do the application not at home, but in class and out in the world. So texting, tweeting, flipping. Now let's go to linking. Well, we all know that students surf. We know that you know, a daily diet for millennials is to you know, go from BuzzFeed to Mashable to Facebook. And by the way, let me just say I'm not a millennial, but I'm really you know, working on reducing the amount of time. I'm on Facebook every day, and I'm now under 12 hours. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and it's very easy to get the idea that you know, they're really sort of wasting a lot of time, that they're very idle in what they're doing. But Let's in fact suppose that you know, a professor gave these same students an assignment. Here are five, here are ten substantive websites. Visit them. Go through them. Find the information there. Link the information you find and then reduce that information to a tweet-sized, text-sized thesis statement that you can use as the basis for further inquiry and research. You know, if you surf creatively and intellectually, you will discover lots and lots of fascinating linkages and connections. You'll learn that the rise of Ronald Reagan as a politician was linked to the rise of air conditioning in the South. You'll find that Lincoln's Gettysburg Address owes a great deal indirectly to ancient fertility myths. You'll discover that the purchase of macaroni and cheese has an intricate connection to the existence or non-existence of recessions. These are things that you can learn by surfing the web intellectually, but it has to be done in an intellectually rigorous way. So that's surfing. And then perhaps my favorite, vlogging, V-L-O-G, video logging. 
Let's go back to Ronald Reagan again, and I, I, I'll try not to do any more hero worship after this, okay? But Ronald Reagan was once asked, Mr. President, how is it that you were able to walk into a room with such great dignity and aplomb and charisma? Other politicians just don't seem to be able to do that. And he said, well, it's not because, you know, I have a special talent. It's because I watch myself do this in Hollywood rushes for many, many, many years years. Thanks to such applications now as QuickTime, it is possible for all of us, and especially millennials, to watch ourselves talk. I'm very glad, by the way, that uh, I rehearsed this talk on QuickTime this morning because it allowed me to remove this piece of spinach that was stuck between my teeth right here, but it's no longer there, as you can see from my close-up. But uh, I think this is, can be a very valuable tool in American higher education. You know, the legendary Professor Roxy Alexander used to say that literacy was important and got you through college, but it's oracy that gets you through life. Oral skills, personal oral skills, which of course inevitably have a visual component. And so thanks to QuickTime and similar applications, you can now watch yourself talk. Students can, in fact, do what Ronald Reagan had the advantage of doing, seeing how they come off to others. And there are ways by which you can improve if, in fact, you actually look at yourself talk. So it now becomes possible through quick time and through collaborative classroom work for Professor Alexander's idea that oracy is also an indispensable feature of higher education, but it was very, very hard to teach before. Now, with high technology, that can be paid attention to. And so if we could synthesize and summarize for a minute, with oracy and quick time and so forth, you can not only, in fact, present your well-honed text length or tweet, Twitter length thesis in person, or with colleagues, or with peers, or on paper with writing, but you can now also present it orally and visually. And then finally, I want to uh, mention retrieval and understanding and memory. And this involves this very, very, very sort of relatively low technology known as email. Now, I know that email today is very low tech. It's right up there with address books you know, and, uh, and uh, postcards. Email seems, oh, so 1990s, right? Okay, but email, in fact, can have a tremendous impact on the processes of American higher education. Suppose, for example, I were an economist, as in, you know, economist the last recession, but I promised to do better predicting the next one, okay? Uh, I know it wasn't very funny, but in any case, suppose I were an economist, and let's suppose that I were uh, teaching an economic principle, which my economist friends tell me is very intricate and complicated, known as the principal agent problem, in which a person who is supposed to be representing your economic interest does not fully do so for a variety of very, very complicated and intricate reasons. So let's suppose that an economics professor lectures on the principal agent problem on a Monday. And then on Friday goes into the class and says, okay, everybody get out his or her laptop. Email a two paragraph summary of your understanding of the principal agent problem and send it to the person next to you. And the person next to you will do the same thing. And then you do that. And then you collaborate with that person. This becomes a way by which through collaboration and through writing to learn, all made possible by email, one can test, test one's understanding, check one's understanding of the principal agent problem, clarify one's understanding of the principal agent problem. You know, a terrific book was put together by a couple of researchers, plus Peter Brown, a 1970 graduate of Beloit College. It's called Making It Stick. And in Making It Stick, there's a whole chapter devoted to how one's understanding and memory is best achieved by retrieval several days after one has learned something. 
memory is in fact inextricably intertwined with retrieval. Well, this kind of retrieval plus collaboration plus clarification is made possible by the miracle that we take now for granted, email. So, texting, tweeting, flipping, linking, surfing, logging, emailing, retrieving, uploading, memory. They're all very, very consistent, not only with liberal arts skills, but also with technology itself. And so my thesis to you today is that millennials, because they are already in this world, are extremely educable. But there is one warning that I would like to post, and that is that this technology cannot become a substitute for the human factor. David Bromwich of Yale has recently written a brilliant essay in the New York Review of Books about the extent to which we learn all the time from spontaneous human interaction. We cannot allow high technology to substitute for spontaneous human interaction, but we must make it a supplement to spontaneous human interaction. If we substitute the one for the other, we will get into a very shoddy and abstract and remote, and remote form of learning and into the possibility of diploma mills. So we must, in fact, ultimately be careful of trying to get rid of the human factor. High technology can be a great supplement to the human factor. It should not ever try to replace it. And then finally, I'll just close very, very quickly by saying one last thing about the world, I think, of millennials. And that is millennials are living as we all are, in an information tsunami. There is more information that is added, indeed, to the cyber world every year than, in fact, is in a 10,000 libraries of Congress. It's, a, it's, it's an astonishing thing. But there are, there's a limit to what information can answer. There are certain mysterious questions. Why does something exist? Why does anything exist? Do we have free will? Does God exist? These are, in fact, questions that no amount of information can answer. And millennials ought to be exposed to these questions precisely because in an information age they should learn the questions, the mysterious questions that no amount of information can ever answer. Why? Because they're going to find the answers? No, because this is one more example of gaining sophisticated intellectual skills, which is really, I submit to you today, what higher learning is mostly and essentially all about. And so I could conclude today by saying that the millennial you educate may very well be your own. And I also say to millennials in the audience that the millennial you educate should also be yourself. Because we're all in this together, we are all connected now. Thank you very much.